It is great to have you on the Family Goals podcast with David Pollock and Pastor Jay. I'm Joel and House, and on this podcast, we want to encourage you to grow closer to God, to strengthen your marriage, and to inspire your family to reach its highest potential. I would like to highlight a ministry that I have loved for years, Compassion International. Compassion is an incredible organization that is all about releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. They currently serve over 2 million children and their families in some of the most poverty-stricken areas of the world, and here is my favorite part. All of this is happening in the local church. Compassion is all about equipping the local church so every single child is cared for by the leaders in their community. As a pastor, I found Compassion to be a strategic part of our global mission strategy. As a church, we've incorporated Compassion into our focus on Honduras. Compassion made it easy for everyone in our church to put their faith in action by caring for a child in need. I would encourage anyone listening to learn more about Compassion, sponsor a child, and release them from poverty in Jesus' name. Visit Compassion.com slash Family Goals to sponsor a child today. Today's special guest is none other than two-time national football champion coach Dabo Sweeney. Check it out. Are y'all in like a closet somewhere? Where are you at? <laughs> we got to make sure we get, we get that. Hey, listen, coach. We started Family Goals in a closet, okay? We did not expect Family Goals um, – to take off like it has, it's definitely been good. And, and having Coach Coach Dabo Sweeney on, obviously, is, is a big deal. But, no, nah, it's taken off. And um, we just started it with a passion to to help people with their families grow, to help people with their walk grow. Um, we talk a little bit of football, but uh, we talk most family. And uh, with, with bringing you on today, obviously, we want to talk some uh, some football. You know, football season's right around the corner. You're in the grind. Um I think everybody looks at Dabo Sweeney, and I've been around you for a number of years, so I know you really well to this point now, but I think everybody looks at Dabo Sweeney and says, man, he's, he's at Clemson getting paid all this money, so much success, you know, so NFL guys left and right. I think people don't realize really how you got the job at Clemson. I want to know, I want you to take everybody behind the curtain and how you got that job, and I believe I heard a quote from you, it was October 8th, I believe, was the date, 2008. When you, uh, when you first started uh, your journey as a Clemson coach, how did you get it? What, what went into it? Yeah, it was, it was actually October 13th. Dang it. Um, Screwed 2000, it up already. 2008. And, um, but, uh, and then my first game was five days later against Georgia Tech. Paul Johnson's first year running the triple option, which I'd never seen at that point. Uh, so that was an was a added bonus for that week. Uh, so. On a short week, that's great. Yeah, man. Uh, well, so, you know, I came to Clemson February of 03. And uh, actually, my first game at Clemson was against you. Uh, and you were, like, unbelievable in that game. And um, so that, that was my first uh, uh, experience with David Pollock, uh, by the way. And uh, so, all, but always, always loved, you know, I always, I've always liked you because I always thought you played the right way. You always had a high motor, tough and and all those things. You saw that when we first watched you on tape. And uh, and then it showed up on game day. You know, you just were a dominant guy every play. And um, so that was my, my beginning here. <clears throat> so I was a, a, the receiver coach for five and a half years. You know, I, I spent uh, I spent 13 years at Alabama, uh, played five years. I uh, was a receiver there. You know, never dreamed of coaching. Uh, I actually, I actually was a pre-med major, biology major for three and a half years, and really wanted to be a pediatrician. That's really what my life goal was. And <clears throat> first college graduate, in my family really first one to go off to school. And and uh, you know, going into that fourth year, I just didn't love it, and I switched over to hospital administration. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to be the CEO of a hospital and run the hospital. So I guess I've always had this passion of helping people. That's kind of always been my mentality, I guess. And and uh, we win the national championship my senior year in 92. Um, and uh, that spring, I was kind of doing my internship at DCH Hospital there in Tuscaloosa and had a couple classes, going to graduate in May. And really, first time in my life, I hadn't been a part of a team and, and uh, you know, go out to spring practice and and – you know, Coach McCorby, who was my receiver coach, who is now our chief of staff here, and and Gene Stallings, who was my head coach and still, you know, my my mentor to this day. You know, he um, 
he he's you know I'm just out there seeing my buds and watching a little spring ball and you know and and uh, next thing I know he's like hey hey Dabo I need a you need to get a master's degree <laughs> and I I need a GA you start in July and, uh, <laughs> no question like no, it wasn't it wasn't and nothing I'm phrased like, question like, wise. Yeah, I'm like, no, which I'm, I'm, I've got a job. I'm gonna start in June. I'm, I'm getting married. I'm, I, I'm done with school. I'm, I don't want him to go any more school. And he said, I said you start in July. Now, what do you not understand about that? <laughs> you know, and it's, uh, it's like I like left the practice field kind of like offended. You know, like who's he think he is? Tell me what I'm gonna do with my life. You know, and uh, and so, uh, but I, I was, I'm still scared of that man to this day. And so, I, I, it was, it was a lot easier for me to call my future boss at that that company I was taking the job with and say hey I'm I'm um I think I need to get a master's degree I'm going to get my MBA and, and they're going to pay for it and I just think that's going to further equip me for one day and and literally uh David within a week of being a graduate assistant it was like that clarity of life like I, all of a sudden you know when you're seeking God's guidance for your life you know you never know who and and it was just like that moment, that was the moment in my life where I had, it all made sense to me. Like everything I had experienced as a kid, everything I had experienced in my family, everything I experienced as a player, I just, it all made sense. It was like, like God had equipped me to do what I do. And I had this clarity of like, wow, first of all, I still love to compete. I still had a chance to be a part of a team. Yeah. And all of a sudden I realized I had a lot of knowledge that I didn't even know I had. And, and I knew that, and I, and I just, and I loved it. And so I knew then that like, this was going to be my, this was what I was called to do. Um, I did, it didn't, I didn't seek it out. It, it literally called me and my wife was the elementary teacher and, and I'm going to coach football. And so, I'm, you know, I'm a GA for three years. And so I ended up coaching there for eight years, come to Clemson. I'm the receiver coach going five and a half years, come to work October 13th on a Monday. Mondays are long days in our business. And, um, you know, I'm in sweatpants and a sweatshirt. It's a cool, we had a 7 a.m. staff meeting that morning. I actually gave the devotion that morning. You know, Coach Bowden, and we do still do it to this what day. What was we the topic? Devotion. Do you remember the topic? Uh, I could go and pull it out of my file <laughs> right now. Uh, I, I, I remember it was, uh, it was, it was uh, Monday morning. We had, we had gotten embarrassed at Wake Forest on the Thursday night previous. And so it was a long weekend already. And now it's my job. I, I just happened to have the Devo. It was my up turn in the rotation. And, um, and so, yeah, I've got it. I can, I, it's, it, I can pull it out and read it. It's, it's, I've read it a few times, but um, um, I did the Devo at 7 a.m. We go on about our work. You know, you go into offensive, defensive staff meetings. I remember we're sitting there doing blitz pickup, studying Georgia Tech, and it's about 10 – it's probably about 10.30 in the morning, and Andy Johnston walks in the, the, the room, which never happens. He was, you know, in those days you had nine coaches, two GAs, and one ops guy. And the one ops guy walks in the room and says, hey, Coach Bowden needs to see everybody in the, in the staff room. Uh -oh. Well, that never happens. We'd already had a staff meeting at 7 a.m. It was kind of a very odd thing. And so all of a sudden everybody's kind of – it was that weird moment like, okay, what's going on here? You know, it's middle of – we're, we're, we're middle of work week. What's happening? And then Coach Bowden walks in, and, uh, you know, he wasn't long. He just kind of came in, and he said, hey, look, it's going to be a change here. And he was really concerned about us. Uh, and he said, hey, you know, and at those days, we all – our contracts were up March 1. You know, we we, we had – everybody's we – didn't, we didn't have – there was no two-year contracts or any of those things. Those things didn't exist. And, and um, um, for the majority of the staff, and, and so he's like, hey, look, the AD's right here in the hallway. He wants to speak to everyone. I'll be talking to all y'all individually, but listen, I appreciate everything and I'm going to be fine. And yeah, he went through this deal and, and he walked out. And, uh, and it was just like, and, and Terry Don Phillips walks in literally uh, instantly. And it was, uh, it was like this, I mean, everybody was just like, you know, sitting there in shock. And, uh, and Terry Don Phillips walks in and, He's not a man. If you know Terry Don Phillips, he's not a man of many words. And he's a, he's a, you know, Frank Burles guy, old D line guy, a uh, long time coach. And he walks in and he just said, basically, look, you know, man, this is something that we agreed to do. And, you know, I'd never want to fire somebody in the middle of the season, but we felt like this was, 
maybe the best thing for everybody involved. And, and uh, you know, listen, uh, I know this is tough. Expect you guys to be professional and, and do your jobs. Um, and then he goes, uh, and he looks at me, and he goes, uh, Dabo, you're now the head coach, and I need you Whoa. to call all the shots, and I need to see you in my office in five minutes. And he turned around and walked out. Oh, and, and man. It was like, I mean, I, I literally, it was one of those moments, I don't know if you've ever had that moment where you feel like your skin is turning inside out, like you're just like, <laughs> you know, like you're in some, it, it was crazy. I, I thought I was having an out of body experience. And I, I mean, I just remember like breaking out into a sweat. Like, I, I'm like, what is happening? Everybody's throwing pencils, slamming notebooks. It's like calling wives, you know, I mean, it was, and then, and then all of a sudden it was this weird, it like just got dead silent in the room and everybody in the room's looking at me. And I, and I, I mean, cause I was just like them. I'm like, I'm just, my mind's like, Oh my God, man. I mean, I got, I just had my third child. And was just born. I mean, a young child. I got two other young kids. I got three young boys. Man, I got to call my wife. I mean, where am I going to be moving? Where am I living? You know, I'm thinking about my players. You know, man, these guys. I mean, it was just, it was just a crazy time. And uh, and it was just this dead silence. And I mean, everybody's and I just look. I remember looking at Brad Scott. And Brad Scott's looking at me. This guy's been a head coach, and and I and and he's like, look, you need to say something. I mean, he's sitting right next to me. And I just said, hey, look, guys, I don't know what to say. I said, let me go meet with this guy. And I said, let me go. That's what I said. I said, let me go meet with this guy. And and we'll just get back together here in a little bit, guys. You know, I don't know what to say. And so I got up, went to my office. I got a notebook. And literally, I'm in sweatpants and, a, and like a sweatshirt, uh, not really dressed to go meet with the AD. And uh, and I, I get a notebook and a, and a, a pen. And I called my wife and I was literally, I called her and I said, babe, we, 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 we got fired. And she's just like, oh my gosh. And I mean, she was just, you know, and I said, no, it gets worse. I said, I'm going to be the interim, you know? And she goes, <laughs> oh my God. And I, and I, cause my mentality was, this is going to be the most miserable six or seven weeks of my life. <clears throat> and because I've been a part of, I had been a part, we, we got fired. Coach Dubos got fired at Alabama in the middle. Well, not middle, toward the end of the 2000 season. And like the last three or four ball games, I was an assistant on that staff. The last three or four ball games, he was, you know, they had already made a change, and it was miserable. You know, yeah, it's hard. It was miserable. <clears throat> they allowed him to stay and finish out the season, but it was miserable. You know, three or four weeks, because uh, you know you just. I mean, it's your livelihood, right? And you don't know where you're going, your family and stuff. And so that was my mentality, David. And it was one of those crazy moments in life because I walked into his office with this mindset of deep breath. Okay, uh, you know, let's let's see what he's going to say. And, and I came out of there, man, just full of life um, because he he told me, he said, look, man, I, I'm, um, I want you to, I want you to, I don't want you to be the interim head. He goes, he goes, Dabo, sit down. He goes, here's what I want to tell you. I know I've put you in a bad situation, but Tommy and I both believe this is the right thing to do. And he said, he said, I've watched you for five and a half years here and how you handle yourself, how you handle your players, uh, how you discipline your players, recruiting guys in your office all the time in the community. He said, I just, he said, I really believe you're what we need at Clemson. And I, and I, I'm, I'm looking at him like, and I didn't really know him like that. And uh, and he's like, and he starts telling me all these things that he had observed for five and a half years. And then he starts saying, and he said, you know, I'm going to hire the best coach for Clemson. And he goes, but I really believe you're what we need. And he said, and here's what I need from you. For the next seven weeks, I want you to be the head coach. I don't want you to think of yourself as an interim coach. I want you to be the head coach. I want you to do whatever you think you need to do to fix us, and I will support you. If you think you need to fire the whole staff, fire them all. He said, whatever it is you need to do, I don't care what it is, for the next seven weeks, I'm going to do it. You have my full support. And he said, and no matter what, win or lose, you're getting an interview for this job. He goes, now I'm going to hire the best coach. And he said, now I'm going to go all over the country and interview everyone. He goes, but in my heart, I'm pulling for you, and you're who I think we need. And he goes, wow. now it sure would help if you could win a few ball games. <laughs> That's what he said. And I, Just and a few. Exactly Make this easy for goes, me. And then he goes, now do you have any questions? And, I, and I'm just like sitting there like dumbfounded. And I said, now you're telling me, you, you're telling me that 
you want me to be the head coach for seven weeks? Like, you're telling me that whatever I need, to, whatever I want to do, I, he's like, yep, whatever you want to do. And he kept using the word to fix us. I'm going to support you. And and that and so I, I literally I came out of that meeting like with wow. I mean, I man, I got a chance. And uh, and you know, and I went, I went in a closet, literally like a little closet area in that old Jervy Jervy building on across campus there where the where his office was, and I just kind of locked myself in there first and I just prayed. And I had this notebook and man, I just started scripting. My mind was going a thousand miles an hour and I just couldn't, I had, I was writing things in corners of the paper. I was just writing stuff down. I had all these thoughts. I mean, all these things. I mean, it was, just, it could be, it was just practice how we're going to travel my team meeting, what I need to tell the staff. I mean, I was just all over the place. And, um, and so I'm just writing all this stuff down. It was about 45 minutes or an hour. And then I went and met with Brad Scott. Um, who's you know old veteran guy been around a long time and and i told him what what terry don said and uh and he was like well boy you got a shot and he's like <laughs> and then i was like and then we you know kind of leaned on him a little bit and and i said well i need to meet so i was like then i was like all right i'm gonna meet with every coach individually and kind of you know challenge everyone like hey the best thing for all of us is to man let's let's, let's go to work it, it'll give us all a chance and, so, you know, had to make a tough change on offense right there. That was the hardest thing I've ever had to do because I really loved the guy there and thought he was a great guy, but there was no way we were going to be successful if I didn't make a change. Uh, so you go from in a meeting with a guy and now you're, you know, Oof. an hour or so later, you're, you're, you're letting him go. Uh, that was very, very difficult thing. Uh, but I knew it was the right thing for, for us to all have a chance. So, you know, hey, it worked out. We went four and two, and and then December one, oh wait, they they gave me the job full time, um, and uh, I didn't even read the contract. I just signed it. <laughs> uh, yes, I please. To, I was just thankful to have the opportunity, and and um, you know, I've got I've got two things that hang on my wall right right in front of me. You know, one says, "As a man thinketh, so is he," and. Uh, and it's got this, it's got this little kitty cat looking into this big puddle and he sees this big tiger. And, uh, and I always tell people, you know, that's what it's all about. It's not, it's not what other people say, how they perceive you. And I, I always tell people that's how, that's how the outside saw Clemson in those days. And, and that's also how they saw me because, you know, they're like, oh, you know, here's this 30 something year old young guy and he never been a head coach, whatever. And, and, um, uh, you know, like I'd just fallen off a turnip truck, you know, I've been, I've been, had been coaching a while, but I, I had gotten out of coaching for two years in 0102 and, um, and got back in. So was just kind of restarting my career there and, and kind of, I guess, came out of nowhere, if you will, for, from a lot of outside people. And, yep. and then I have, I have framed beside it. I have a big ESPN graphic that says coaching hires have been a, a laughing riot this holiday season. And they gave the grades and Clemson, Clemson got uh, a D plus uh, for their hire, and uh, oh, and for Dabo, D for Dabo, you know, that's what it was. That D, D for Dabo, <laughs> and the plus is for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So that's the cross. Uh, that's how I look at it. And so those are two things that that just you know all came about. But at the end of the day, I tell people all the time: you never know who's watching. Yep. You never know who's watching. So just be great at whatever it is you do. You never know who's paying attention. Number one, and then number two, be prepared for yep. your opportunity. You may never get it, but boy, you know, be prepared. And, and I was prepared. I had prepared since I got into coaching in 1993 to be a head coach. And even if I didn't, I didn't know if I was gonna ever get an opportunity. How did you prepare coach? Prepared. What did that look like? How, how did you do that along the way? Yeah, I, st I literally, once I made, got into coaching, I started, I, I just started, I, I've always been a very organized person, uh, you know, probably, probably over the top organized. That's just kind of how I'm wired. And I literally started in 1993. I started this little coaching book, if you will. And, and, and it started out as when I first got into coaching as a GA, man, I, you know, there was no, we didn't have computers and all that stuff. So, <laughs> like drawing and I'm, so I started this form book, like, Oh, I like that. That's a good practice format. That's a good play format. That's a good, and, and it started out as that. And I started organizing this book and then it kind of grew into philosophy leadership stuff, motivation stuff. And then it was like, oh man, uh, this would be great discipline things. 
and and then it was organizational stuff. Then it was coaches uh, that I would want to hire one day, you know, uh, section. And then it was, uh, you know, okay, what would be my academic policies? And it just kind of grew for years. And so the good thing about that, uh, man, when it came time uh, to interview for this job, man, I was able to walk in with a plan. And I was able to walk in with like, this is who I am. This is who Clemson's football is going to be. This is the infrastructure we're going to have. These, this is my philosophy of offense, defense, special teams. These are the people I'm going to hire. Here's what my first year, here's my first 13 month calendar right here. I had it all planned out all the way through the next August camp. Uh, every day, spring practice, when the kids are off, you name it, all laid out. Here's going to be our recruiting policies and expectations. Here's our staff guidelines. Here's our here's here's the staff expectations and responsibilities of every person in the in the. So you know, it it really demonstrated that not only did I have a plan and could articulate the plan, but we could execute the plan, and we had we had processes in place, and and uh, so. I'm so thankful that I did that. I mean, again, I started that literally when I became, I was just curious and I, and I started learning and studying and, and I still do that to this day. And in fact, I just finished my, I call it the all in book now. And um, we, we take about five days every July and we get together as a staff as if we all just met for the first time. And I reinstall the program and, and reinstill the culture of this place every single year as if no one knows anything and uh, in fact, I, I love the process. I do it in May, early June every year. I just kind of re- rebuild my book and update it, tweak it, because things evolve and change. And and and, uh, and so it's it's kind of been a, uh, a, a something that has really truly been a foundational thing for me. In, in my entire coaching career, and continues to be so. So because you were prepared. Because you were ready for the, because you were along the way, you were being good at what you were. Because here's here's a couple of things I take away. You you were prepared. Um, the 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 AD had seen your work already. Like he had already watched you relate to players. You know he'd already watched you show discipline. He already seen your character. So he'd already seen who you are every single day. He believed in yep. you. Another thing too is like I take away, and this is kind of crazy to think about now because of where you're at, but. He believed in you before you believed in you. Yeah, listen, listen, that's a great point, David. And, and that's what it takes. To, and man, it takes it takes conviction, you know. Um, and this guy, Terry Don Phillips, there's not many people out there like him anymore, especially in our world where in this 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 intense uh, everybody caves to the mob mentality and negativity and and it's like everybody wants to be liked and so they're you know oh my gosh you better align with everything everybody says or whatever and 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 you better win the popular uh, opinion if you're going to hire somebody or whatever man this guy he was so and he he, he believed in me way more than I believed in myself. And, and so part of my testimony, when I speak, a couple of things I tell people, we limit ourselves by how we think. All right, you tell me, I'm going to make the point about conviction. But so the UAB job came open in like 2006 or seven. All right. And man, I got a call in with the AD there at the time. And, and man, that was my dream job. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get an interview. And I and I'm like I'm gonna go up that weekend. I'm gonna have a chance to interview. And man, I talked to a lot of the key people. And and so man, I, I'm telling you, I was so excited. I'm like, we're gonna man, I'm going home. I'm going to Birmingham. We're gonna build Blazer Nation. I'm gonna build the. We're gonna freaking out recruit Alabama and Auburn. We're gonna beat them all. You know, <laughs> Bring like, them all on. Hey, I had my staff put together. I'm like, man, I'm freaking coach. I'm going back to Legion Field. I was so excited. I mean, I'm like. I'm 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 36 or something like that, and I'm like I could just man I'm going back to Birmingham, my family. Like this is just like I just knew this is what God wanted for me. I just knew it, and I mean I put I had, so I had my book together, had my UAB Blazer Nation book, had it all put together. I'm ready to go interview. I'm going up there, and all of a sudden, I mean I've already called all my staff. Hey, will you come take this job? I got people excited all over. I just wanted to be ready and prepared, and I get a call before I could ever even get in the car and go that Thursday that they had hired a coach. They went ahead and hired a coach. And I'm just like, 
Oh my God. I, and I was devastated. And I, and mm. probably, you know, I remember, and I probably shouldn't have, but I think I fired off an email to the AD. It was one of them. I was, you know, <laughs> mad in the moment type of deals. I'm like, you're never going to get a chance to hire me again. I'm just like, you know, I was like, I can't believe, I can't believe I'm not even going to get a chance to just like, I'm from there. Like, man, this is, man, I'm, I have a vision for UAB. And, and, and I was just remember being so disappointed. And, and I was like, man, I just was like, I just knew that was going to be an opportunity. If I could just get, if I could just have gotten the interview, I'm like, man, I'm going to get this job. A year and a half later, I'm the head coach at Clemson. I'm the head coach at Clemson a year and a half later. And so what I learned from that is, man, God's plans are always bigger than our plans. God's plans are always bigger than our plans. I, I was limiting myself by how I thought. I, I thought I was, I, you know, I would have never thought I was going to be the Clemson coach. But God's closed that door because he had something bigger for me. And, and so I, I get this job. And my very first year in 09, David, uh, you may or may not remember, but we won the division and went to the ACC championship. Uh, and, and man, it was, you know, everybody was excited. Now we lost in the championship game to Georgia Tech. Uh, C.J. Spiller was the MVP of the game. We lost. Neither team punted. It was a crazy game. Um, and they beat us right there at the end. And, you know, we, we go on and win the Music City Bowl and all that. So we had a pretty good first year. We won nine games, and it was a big deal. My second year, oh, my God, we, we lost five games by six points or less, two in overtime. Overtime at Florida State, overtime at Auburn against Cam Newton. And every game was just like down, and we, and we just couldn't make a kick. It was like we just weren't – it was crazy. So we lose to South Carolina in 2010 in the Valley. We're 6-6. Six and six, And, man, I'll never forget this. And that's just my point about conviction and what it takes, okay, and the type of belief before anybody else believes. Um, I come up after the game, you know, all the stuff, it's obviously incredibly disappointing. It's my second year. We won. People, a, lot, a lot of people weren't really happy that I got the job anyway and didn't believe in me um, and, um, and was like, what is Clemson doing? And they were like, well, good, now we can get rid of this guy. You know, it was bad. <laughs> it was very negative. There was a lot of, a lot of negativity at the time. And uh, now we just lost to South Carolina. And I walk out of the press conference and I'm walking, I'm over in the West End Zone and I got to walk back to my office. And as I come out of the press room and I walk in the hallway toward my office, my wife, Kathleen's standing there and she's got just tears in her eyes. And, and she just gives me this biggest hug. And she just says, she just said, she just goes, I am so sorry, babe. And I, and I, and I'm just like, it's going to be okay. Listen, I'm like, and she goes, and then I, I, I could tell that there was something else. I thought she was just telling me she was sorry about the game. And she goes, and she goes, Terry Don's in your office. And, uh, mm. and I just went, and I just, oh my gosh. <laughs> and I, so I just kind of knew what that meant, you know, and I just took a deep breath and I just gave her a hug and, and I said, Hey, look, we're going to be okay. And I said, Kath, you know what? God never says oops. And I said, I've done the very best I can. I know that. And I said, that's all I can do. And I just kind of, I just kind of got my composure and, and, um, and I came around the curve and there was my lights were off in my office, but the door was cracked. And I saw Terry Don Phillips sitting on the couch. He was just kind of sitting on the couch, just kind of rocking in a dark office. And I just took a deep breath and I walk in and he says, he says, hey, come on over here and sit down. So I go over and sit down. And then, again, this is one of those moments. I'm thinking like, you know, my mind is in a different place. I'm like, he's. You know what? He's going to fire me. And I'm trying to think about how I want to just thank him for the opportunity. And, and he looked at me and he said, he said, Dabo, listen to me. He said, um, he said, I want you to know something. He said, I want you to listen to me. He said, I believe in you more right now than when I hired you. He said, and I know there's going to be a lot of negativity, going to be a lot of criticism. He said, but I just want you to know, I think you're going to be one of the greatest coaches that we've ever had. And wow. he said, I just, I just want to tell you that I believe in you more right now than when I hired you. And he said, and I know you're going to do whatever you got to do. We're going to continue to get better. He goes, but I just want you to know that. And then he goes, and then he said, he said, and I don't care what you hear. I want you to know I have your back. And he said, and here's the deal. If it don't work out, you can come help me pack. And then I'll come help you pack. 
He Dang. goes, but I got your back. And he gave me the biggest hug and he got up and he said, you hang in there. And he walked out the door. Now that's conviction. That's Terry Don Phillips. And that right there, in that moment right there, there was no way I could let this man down. And, and his belief in me when other people didn't even see it or believe it. Uh, but that's why we've won here is because our team has believed. It's been an attitude of belief, uh, a, a belief that we can, you know, and, and, you know, everybody looks at Clemson now and now we win 11 games and everybody, you know, thinks we're terrible. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> we, we, when I got the job, we, we hadn't won 10 games in 20 years. We hadn't won the championship here in 20 years. Now we've won it eight times in 11 years. We've had 12 10 plus win seasons. That's the third longest streak in the history of college football. And uh, so none of that happens. None of that happens without one person of belief. And it just goes you to show when you have one person of conviction, of belief, and then you have the right people in place of what can happen. Dabo, congratulations on all the success. Um, I'm Pastor Jay. David didn't even introduce me to you. He's My bad. I mean, we're like 30 minutes in, and uh, <laughs> he hasn't even introduced me to Dabo Sweeney. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, you probably I, played offense. He played defense. You probably played <laughs> offense, you know. I played Defensive tennis. Guys just go right. They just they just blitz. The, they just rush the pass. Yeah. Right <laughs> go get them on the well, ground. I played tennis in college, and Davey doesn't even consider that a sport. He no. says tennis players aren't very athletic. But uh, it's obvious that God, you're you're fulfilling God's call in your life, and mm-hmm. and I love what you said that God had a bigger plan for you than you had for yourself. And I think about, I was reading about your story growing up, and and there there was a, a part about it when you were in college and your mom, you and your mom were living together on off campus housing, uh, in yep. a, an apartment. And I just think about your background. You mentioned earlier that you were the first one to graduate from college. And I just, I just think it's, it's amazing what God has done in your life all of these yep. years. I wanted to hear about your testimony. You, you mentioned about when you share your testimony, how did you yep. come to know Christ and, and how has Christ been the center uh, of what you're doing there at Clemson? Well, you're, you're dead on. I mean, listen, I, I, I am purpose driven. I mean, I, I don't, I've never been out to prove anything to anybody. You know, I, I just, I'm always trying to live my purpose, you know, and fulfill my purpose. Um, and uh, for a long time, I didn't know what my purpose was. But as I said earlier, man, you know, God revealed the purpose for me. My purpose is to, is to glorify him in everything I do, to, to be a great husband and father, and to use the platform of education and football to, to hopefully build great men that go on and become transformational leaders in, in society. You know, that's really my purpose. And that's what I wake up and do every day. If we can win a bunch of games along the way, great. Uh, But I'm really not, I'm not driven by, you know, outcomes of what we do. I'm really driven by the love of what it takes. I'm I'm driven by my purpose. And uh, it's always been that way. But uh, I got saved when I was 16 uh, at an FCA event, February 3rd, 1986. Uh, I did not grow up in a, I grew up in a home that believed in God for sure. Uh, but I didn't know what a relationship with Christ was all about. I had no idea and didn't understand any of that type of stuff. And maybe three boys. Uh, my parents were married at 18 years old. My dad was an appliance man, fixed washers and dryers. Uh, my mom cut hair and, uh, you know, um, uh, just, just, uh, <clears throat> I, you know, if I was growing up today, I would be labeled as an at risk kid. That's kind of, you know, how we like to label everybody today. I would have been a labeled kid. Uh, no education in the home. Uh, uh, violence in the home. My father was an alcoholic. Uh, parents divorced. <clears throat> Single mom. Uh, you know, between my, she's my sophomore and senior year, I can't remember how many times I moved and all the places I lived. Uh, ultimately, my senior year, my mom and I got evicted from a little place. We moved in with a friend and I slept on a floor in the den and she slept upstairs with his sister and uh, my wife, Kathleen, she comes from the other side of the world. Everybody's a PhD, a teacher, a master's. And that's why, you know, my wife and I've been together since the first grade. We started dating in the sixth grade and dated through high school and college and been married 29 years. And, 
And uh, she never judged me. She would drive me. I didn't have a car. She picked me up, drove me everywhere. But, you know, thankfully I played, uh, you know, I was, I was a natural student and a natural athlete and I played three sports and because man, I had my coaches and man, they just, I was always involved and I was always doing stuff and they, they just, and I went through those stages of embarrassment and all that stuff. And eventually I got to a point where because I found Christ, I just had peace. And even though my life was a disaster on the outside looking in, man, I had just, I had a clear vision of what I wanted to do and what I could do and a belief in that. And I had hope, you know, I always say, you know, you know, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you and their plans for good, not disaster. And, and what I've always held on from that is if there's hope in the future, there's power in the present to deal with whatever it is you're dealing with. And uh, so, you know, I just hung on to that, man. And, and I had just good people in my life, but in the eighth grade, one of my best friend at the time, he, I was playing on the high school team. He was playing in the youth league still. And his youth league coach was just this 26 year old guy. And uh, just liked to coach. And, but he would, every time we'd go play basketball or this and that, man, Stewart would want to come hang out with us. And I'm like, and every time we'd have to pray. And I mean, he's always talking about Jesus and, and I'm like, why, why do we got it? Why is Stuart? Like, why is he hanging out with us? We're 14, you know? And I mean, it, it, you know, it was like, and he'd take us to the church to go play basketball. That was kind of his, his thing. Code. And, <laughs> and, and Stu, but Stuart Wiley, and he's a great friend of the day and a mentor to this day. And, and he's, here's another example. God can use anyone. Everybody thinks you got to be the head coach at Clemson, or you got to be David Pollock or whatever, or be the pastor of a church to, to, to impact the kingdom. Uh, no. He took this just normal guy and Stuart was passionate about his walk with Christ. And he saw a young lost kid uh, and knew the dynamics of my life. And, and he and he saw that I didn't know Christ. And he started pouring into me, sowing seeds into me. I go to high school the next year. We didn't, there was no such thing as an FCA or anything. There was nothing like that at Pelham. He starts an FCA program at Pelham High School my ninth grade year. And we start meeting on Wednesday nights. Originally, they wouldn't let us meet at the school. Uh, my coach didn't think that was cool. And then he finally realized, you know what, Hey, these guys like each other. And next thing you know, we're meeting at the school. And, and, um, uh, and so 10th grade, I went to hear one of my childhood heroes, a guy named Joey Jones. Hmm. And, uh, who, who weirdly later on in life became a great friend. He became a high school coach. I'm coaching at Alabama. I was recruiting his school. Then he was the South Alabama coach, but but Joey Jones played for the Falcons and the Birmingham Stallions. And man, that was, he was like a hero. He was a little receiver at Alabama. And, and uh, so we went to these FCA events and I started learning how to fellowship, how to worship through music. I started really learning what the, what the Bible was all about. And I started learning how to pray and the importance of that. And man, man, God was working on me. And I go February 3rd, 1986 to listen to Joey Jones at, at, at the local church there. He was speaking and our FCA group went. And next thing I know, man, I'm, I'm back there getting prayed with, with Joey Jones to accept Christ as my Lord and Savior. I went home that night and I wrote it down. In my Bible, I still got it to this day. I wrote it down. I dedicated my life to Jesus tonight. My life will never be the same. I signed it and uh, dated it. And about every five or six years, I've made an entry in that same Bible. And it was one of them Bibles my mom had given me as a kid, you know, and I was like, you know, open it up. You know, it was like one of those that's hard as a brick, knock you out, build a house on it uh, type of Bible. <laughs> and I still got it to this day. Uh, but that's really kind of where my journey started. And man, really what I've learned, my, my fundamentals, we have to keep our eyes on him uh, to, to always believe and don't ever quit. You know, when the adversity comes in life. You know, you, you have to you have to continue to do those things. And if you do, man, God's going to lead you. Uh, you're going to have a lot of adversity that, that's never going to go away. But with God in your life, he will use it to develop you and to help you fulfill the purpose that he's created you for. Uh, not 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 allow it to define or destroy you. Uh, but you have to have God, you know, at, at the center to be able to do that. And I always tell uh, people it's like a flat football if you had a flat football, it'd be hard for it to fulfill its purpose, right? It'd be hard for it to, you know, throw it, kick it, and do all these things and fulfill the purpose it was created for. And it's the same thing with us as people if we don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. You know, it, it, it's hard. We're just like that flat football walking around in life. It'd be hard for us to fulfill and know the purpose that we're created for. And uh, so 
I just, you know, you know, and, and like anybody, you know, you get off path, you get this and that, but I just yeah. kind of just stayed with those fundamentals, man. No matter what, I would just, I would just come back to, man, I just got to keep my eyes on God. I don't understand. I don't know why, but I, I just know. And I got to continue to believe even when it doesn't make any sense. And man, I just can't quit. I can't quit. And if I do that, man, God, God, God will, will pave the path. And man, I would, I would have to be some kind of idiot to have any kind of doubt that there's a God with what I have lived and experienced, you know, my, you know, I went to college, my mom ended up moving in with me my sophomore year and not only moved in with me in a two bedroom, one bathroom apartment, we had a roommate, uh, but she and I had to sleep in the same bed for three years, my sophomore, junior and senior year at Alabama, you know, and she became kind of like a team mom. She'd cook on Monday nights cause mm -hmm. that was her off day and all the guys would come over and, you know, she'd drive an hour to Birmingham, get up at five 30 in the morning, every morning, drive an hour to Birmingham to work at the mall. And, uh, you know, she's tough as nails. Um, and man, it just, that was one of the greatest, uh, driving things in my life was to go be successful. And, and I didn't use those as reasons and excuses for poor behavior or bad decision making. I, I saw those as reasons to not do a lot of things, to go, to get my books, to do what I needed to do, because I, I really, truly, God gave me a vision for what my life could look like. I didn't know what his plan for me was, but I knew this. He had a plan, and it was a lot better than what mine was. And if I trusted him, man, he was going to provide the way. And no matter what, man, and, and when I made a decision to be a coach, I, I didn't know what I was going to coach, high school, whatever. I just wanted to coach. I knew we were never going to be rich or anything like that. Didn't care. Kath was teaching. I'm going to coach. We're happy, and, and this is what we're going to do. And uh, and then you look up here. I am 53 now. I came to Clemson. This will be my 21st season here. I thought I'd be here a year or two, and I'm going on year 21 and my 15th year as the head coach. And and that's why I'm 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 always try to be cautious and passionate about just making sure people know that man. This you know God deserves all the glory. I mean I'm just I mean I I, I mean I wish I could tell everybody I'm just smarter than everybody else and all that. But this was just His plan for me. And uh, and I don't take it lightly because I know one of these days, man, you know, it's it, as I tell coaches, it, it's one of these days. I mean, they make the scoreboard bigger and bigger every year in Death Valley. Uh, <laughs> so I, I know what my job is and I know it's important, but there's a bigger scoreboard to me. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of these days, it, it's not going to be the X's and O's I knew. It's the hearts and souls we grew you know, through this platform. I mean, God has put a lot of young hearts and minds and mm. souls in front of us and they don't all get it, but I, I think it is my responsibility to, uh, you know, be a good example to them and to, and to do our job in a way that hopefully glorifies God as we do it. Well, and, and I get to go, you know, everywhere in the country and I will a hundred percent say, uh, you know, your culture is different and what you believe is different. The way you talk to kids is different. Like, and, and now I see Terry D and I see, and I hear about Joey Jones and I hear about all these people like that, that believed in you that poured into you. Now it feels like you're building a culture that you're going to do the same thing. And, and you're trying to accomplish the same goals that, that you were uh, so fortunate to get. And, and, and how cool is it that you can relate to a lot of these kids, you can relate to their yeah. situations and what they went through and, I mean, is that because everybody knows about the culture at Clemson and we, you've talked about it for years. We talk about it on television and how different it is. And I mean, this is it's kind of cool to see all the things that made you you that has turned into your culture. Yeah. You know, everybody wants us to always, you know, if everybody's going right, we're supposed to go right. Well, you know, I don't I don't look at it that way. Sometimes we do, but I've never really tried to conform to the way everybody thinks we should do things <laughs> we because we are purpose driven. You know, we're not outcome driven here. We are purpose driven. We are relationship driven. I mean, I got 20 something former players on this staff. Uh, this is, this is, I've, I've had, uh, we, we, we've not been a portal program. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, we just don't have leave kids leaving. We've not had a single starter leave this program. Not one. Uh, we've had two kids leave Clemson post spring in the last two years, and neither one of them wanted to leave. They're both graduates, but one was a sixth DN and the other one's a sixth corner, and they just wanted to play. They love Clemson. Uh, so, you know, we, we have, we've offered 59 guys in the class of 24. 
59 in the world. All right. If you and we're sick and then the power 65, we're 64th in fewest offers. If you look at uh, if you look at uh, the the uh, top of the spectrum, the number one offer team is probably 470 something offers. So it's a different approach and it's, and everybody has to do their own thing. But but, you know, that's just who we are here, man. We are until graduation. Do you part place? I mean, 11 out of 12 years have been top 10 academically, Clemson, Duke and Northwestern. Uh, so, you know, I've had 356 seniors and 350 graduates. Second in draft picks since I've been a head coach. Second in first round picks since I've been a head coach. Uh, so we we've won. We're the only team academically and in football eleven years in a row. So we've done things in a unique way, and I know the way we do it uh, is is the right thing for Clemson. And again, you know, we're we're very connected here, uh, and we don't compromise from that. You know, and so. Uh, it's, a, it's like I said, it's a place that uh, we really, truly value who they are as young people. Not that other people don't, but it's something we're really, it's just, it's just, I really am passionate about transformation in their lives. All right. And, and that's the greatest thing for me as a coach is seeing that guy at 15 and 16 and then seeing him again at 30 or 28. And man, the guy comes and hugs your neck. I mean, that's, that's, that's transformation, and that is my greatest joy as a coach, knowing that you had a, a, a part of that person's journey and growing. And I wish we could say we bat a thousand. We don't, but but you know we're pretty good. And uh, you know, for every one person that might say something negative about their Clemson experience, there's 200 that are going to talk about um, how good it was. Hey, coach, how much harder is that now with with NIL? And then in the new world of, of football, because we, we've seen it, man. It's just totally different. And, you know, yeah. the colors, man, I, I can't imagine. Like, I hated everybody else in college football besides my school. And now, you know, money's changed things. H how much is that different? It, it, building a culture yeah. and trying trying to establish something, be different and, and having people leave and people wanting to come and money. How much money are you going to pay me? All that stuff that goes yeah. into it. If I was getting the job now and I really – feel for a lot of these coaches that are trying to get going now because it's crazy. But, but again, we're so connected here and, and we've always been, you don't just all, cause you don't get the toothpaste back in the tube, right? You don't just all of a sudden become purpose driven. You don't just all of a sudden become relationship driven. Uh, you know, we've been doing this for a long time here and to be, I mean, it, it sounds crazy, but the crazier it's gotten, the better it's been for us. I don't know if that, that makes any sense, but we really uh, we don't do, use NIL in recruiting. We use it for retention. Uh, you know, I'm all about the guys here. I've never, ever been about the recruiting part of it. You know, my focus has always been our staff, the quality of their life and their family's life. And it's always been about the guys in the locker room. And I really have always said, if we do a great job in that area, the recruiting will take care of itself. And, and, and I went, you know, I went viral, uh, I don't know, a couple months ago, people love to take things and make clickbaits and I'm sure somebody will get something out of this one. Um, you know, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm beyond caring at this point. Uh, I really don't, but I, I made a comment because somebody asked me a question. Uh, they asked me a question about the NIL and I, and I, and I, the NIL has been great for us. We we built an unbelievable facility called the Cab, and the Clemson Athlete Branding Institute, first standalone facility in the country. I hired an NIL coordinator, a guy that used to run Citibank, because I see it as just another opportunity to prepare our guys. You know, um, that's what I see it as. I see it as a, an opportunity for guys to take advantage of some things. But it's not a free ride. What does a cab do? It gives you a lift to your destination, but you got to pay the toll. It's not a free ride. And you have all these misconceptions and there are some of those things are true that's going on in other places, but not here. You know, uh, our guys on our roster have an opportunity to participate. And, you know, I've always said one of the we've all for 14 years, we've done Paul journey here, you know, tax education, financial literacy, all these things, agent education, contract stuff, blah, blah, blah. And now we get a chance to really have some hands on experience, to even further prepare our guys. You know, I see it as a responsibility. So let's maximize it, but let's let's teach them, let's educate them, let's protect them, 
let's help them navigate this world that they're out there and and let's further prepare them. Over 80% of the guys who've gotten a shot in the NFL since I've been a head coach have made it. And I really believe it's because of where they're coming from. And I always tell the scouts, we got from Clemson and this guy, take the guy from Clemson. He's going to make your team. Hmm. He's a free agent. He's a draft pick because he's a graduate. He knows how to work. He's been, he's been held accountable. He's, you know, blah, blah, blah. We go through that. And now, now that you know this, almost 78% of NFL players within two years of being done are bankrupt and divorced. And part of the reason is they're not equipped and prepared properly. And these are, these are mid twenties to 30 year olds, right? We're not going to get a different result with 17, 18, 19, 20 year olds. And so I see my job is, is man, we've got to help these guys navigate this. And so we've poured a lot of resources and it's been great. And listen, this is Clemson. You can do anything you want, but we've not pre NIL. We never got the kids that could be manipulated post NIL. We still don't get them, you know? Uh, and I said something a, a couple months ago, they asked me the question. And I just said, they asked me if I was worried about all this and that. And I'm like, and look, we just signed one of the best classes in the history of our program last year. Uh, and guess what? We're getting ready to sign maybe the best class ever this year. Uh, and, and, and right in the middle of all this, but the, the cool thing, and we've offered 59 kids, not 400, 59 on the planet. And we're going to sign one of the best, but it's because of how we do things. It's our conviction and our belief in, in, in the way we do it. It's the criteria that, that we have for position guys. And, and, you know, I tell our coaches, man, the reason we're stingy is this is not a catch and release place. I'm not running kids out of here. I, this is till graduation do we part. If your player ain't good enough, you better not ever complain about them. All right? If they ain't good enough, that's our fault. If a guy, unless he becomes a turd, he's going to be here as long as it takes. And so that everybody knows that's our approach. And what the cool thing, and I, and I said the comment was the lady asked me about it, and I, and, I, and I meant it, but, I mean, of course, it went viral. And I said, they asked me if I was worried. I was like, no. I was like, I'm not worried about it. I said, because we built this program on NIL. And I said, we, we built this program in God's name, image, and likeness. And, and as I've always said, I think for all of us, if we would build our lives in God's name, image, and likeness, he'll take care of all that other stuff. And I made that comment. And, oh, my gosh. I mean, I mean, it went crazy. I'm against player. I mean, it was just stupid stuff. And, uh, and so, but I mean it because, and I, I look at it as, as, and it's hard to understand unless that's your mindset. But as a Christian, I look at it as this is God's work. You know, like you're doing God's work this morning. You know, and to me, I mean, Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, you do it with all your heart as if you're working for the Lord. Not just if you're a preacher, right? Yeah. No, if you're doing a podcast, if you're working for ESPN, if you're a football coach, if you really, or if you're a Christian, then that's your mindset. And that is my mindset, whatever I do. Do it with all your heart as if you're working for the Lord. If you're cleaning your room, you ought to do it with all your heart as if you're working for the Lord. If we all had that perspective, this world would be a better place. You know, if we really like, man, I'm working for the Lord. Okay, boy, I better, I better, I better tighten things up here. And, and God's work done God's way never lacks provision. And, you know, I have a staff that's out on the front line. They get beat up here and there. And I'm like, guys, just, just trust me. Listen, and, and it's, and it's been, and it's so encouraging it really is to see the young people because honestly, David, the coaches dread bringing a kid to me because I spend more time trying to talk them out of coming here than I do coming. <laughs> We're brutally transparent. We're brutally honest. Nobody's coming here not knowing exactly what I mean, they, they, nobody comes here and goes, dang, they serious about this class stuff around here. No, I am serious. You know why? Because less than 2% play in the NFL. 98 plus percent aren't going to play in the NFL. And we've lost our way around here. You know, the adults have left the room. Nobody talks about education anymore. And what's going to happen is you're going to have a bunch of 25, 26 year olds that maybe made some short term money, but they don't have degrees. And that's sad to me. And so our philosophy is we're going to graduate our players. We're going to equip them as men. They're going to have some fun and we're going to win a championship. And it's never going to be in a different order than that. And it never has been. And all I can tell you is just look and see what's happened. And, you know, even in the past, everybody's like, oh, no, gosh, we won 10 games, we won 11 games, won the league last year. What's wrong with Clemson? I think I think there's only four teams that have more wins than us in the past two years in the country. Uh, you know, so, I mean, we're not going to win the national championship every year. 
That's and honestly, it's not a goal. My goal is to be the best we can be year in and year out and to fulfill the purpose of this program. And if we do that, hey, we'll have those great moments. I'm not defined by those things. I'm more driven by, you know, the journey. It always have been. Because when you win, you wake up, all right, great. Now what? You know, yeah. uh, it's always, it's got to always be about, you know, uh, the journey and the process of, of what your purpose is. So um, it's, it's just, honestly, it's been, it's been encouraging. I mean, it's sad to see some things that are going on in college football. But in a weird way, it's also good because I think sometimes you just got to have the train wreck and, you know, to clean it up. And, um, you know, I, I, I can clearly see what's coming in college football. Um, and um, but I, I'm like, like, let's just go ahead and get there and then we can we can we can uh, get to a better place. And I think I think we will get to a better place in college football. Unfortunately, I think some young people are going to are, are going to pay the price for some things uh, because we've. There's no consequences for young people anymore. No consequences for young people leads to no conscience. And, you know, we've made it cool, convenient, and celebrated to, to give up, you know? And I'm not saying there's not a time where, where you need a change. Uh, but I think, you know, we've, we've taken away all reason for pause. And, and there's a lot of... Uh, young people that get manipulated and all that stuff. And it's sad to see that, but I can just tell you the crazier it's gotten, the better it's been for Clemson uh, because nice. of how we're built. And, and it's so exciting to see a young person say, Hey, cause they know. And for a young person to say, Hey, man, I want to go be a part of that. And I'm talking about some of the best players in the country that could go anywhere. They want to come be a part of who we are at Clemson. That's exciting to me. Never gets old. And uh, I don't have any doubt, man. Um, you know, we got a we got a lot of great moments ahead, but most of all, we're going to build a lot of great men that I really believe are going to be incredible leaders in life. You know, I'm not going to be here forever. Uh, we we run this program for what's best for the 30 year old version of that kid. You know, that's that's our mindset. And but I and I know that that one of these days, my legacy is going to be what these guys do in their lives. And in and, and my 14 years as the head coach here, man, we've got so many young people that are equipped that are going to, they're, they're going to be transformational leaders, you know, may not see it till 20 years from now, 30 years from now, but, but we've got some amazing people that have come through this program. And uh, I'm just thankful that I've had a part, be a part of the journey. And, you know, there's a lot of people that don't like me out there because I wear a logo. And I always tell everybody, man, a man's got to have a job, right? And, uh, and and we're supposed to be, we're supposed to try to do a, do a great job at whatever we're called to do, and that's what I do, you know. Dang uh, right. Every single day. That's what you should do. And and we got you got Khalil Barnes, who's right here at North Oconee down the road, who just joined you. So we'll be cheering for Khalil. Obviously, getting to coach him the last year was just amazing. He's just a great kid. But thank you so much yes. for Pastor Jay. And for David Pollock, thank you so much for joining us, Big Dog. We really appreciate your time. Thank you for listening to this week's Family Goals podcast with David Pollock and Pastor Jay. Dabo had so many amazing quotes and takeaways from this podcast. Here are some of my favorites. God never says oops. It's hard for a flat football to fulfill its purpose. It's not about the X's and O's. It's about the lives and souls. And it's that last one that I love most and the way that Dabo lives his life. He cares way more about building up great men of God than by getting wins. Yes, winning is important, but he is fulfilling his God-given purpose and using his platform as a coach to impact lives for all eternity. If you found this episode helpful, encouraging, or entertaining, please let us know by subscribing to the podcast or by writing a review. You can also reach us on Instagram and Twitter at Family Goals Pod. Thank you again for listening to the Family Goals Podcast, and we'll catch you next week.